and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Popular television programming has helped boost the interest in forensic science. While TV programs make crime solving look easy, in reality the science is demanding. It includes fields such as biology, chemistry, and engineering. A class at the University of Vermont provides an introduction to forensic biology. Across the fences, Rebecca Gollin spoke with students who are involved in autopsies, fingerprinting, and real-life investigations. A lot of it, the first part of the semester is figuring out cause of death and figuring Brooke out... Brooke Benoit's like, description of one of her classes sounds alarming, but figuring out cause of death is par for the course in this introduction to forensic biology class. Forensics means the study of the science of crime. So the study of a crime scene or to figure out who committed a crime. Dr. Amanda Yonan is a lecturer in the biology department. We know when we have 10, right? We can tell if we have a complete set of fingerprints. I'm going to cover autopsies, identifying different causes of death, trying to figure out the difference if it was a suicide versus a homicide. And then we cover arson. Today's class was about fingerprinting techniques and what sort of different techniques there are, what kind of fingerprints get left behind. So the ones that go s sort of smooth are called plain arches, and the ones that have a sharp point in the center are called tented arches. And I'm sure some people in the classroom have arches on some of your fingers. They happen about 1 in 20 of us. This is one of my favorite parts about this lecture specifically is about a third of the way through they're all just looking at their fingers rather than listening to me and I'm like yep they're looking to see if they have whorls or loops. I discovered that I have all arches. <laughs> Biology major and Megan Hillow like is planning to pursue a career as a medical examiner. Learning about the different techniques used in the field is giving her a solid foundation for the future. On this day, the students are also getting the chance to get their hands on and in the evidence, so to speak. So go ahead and try that. You need to hold the brush and like kind of sort of roll the powder over it without smudging the oils of your skin. We work a lot with case studies too, like the O.J. Simpson trial. We'll pull out details of it and figure out how can that relate to what we've been learning about. Um, so like with the O.J. Simpson, um, he was ultimately not convicted because um, some of the blood was missing from the lab. So it's something that people know about, but then we related it to our class. Why was that important? We don't have to look at every single set of prints. Yonan's specialty is genetics. So when you're Guest lecturers class, and professionals have, in a wide you know, variety of forensics-related fields often like come to class and talk about the specifics really of their work like as well. I like to kind of just hold it like this and just kind of just kind of twirl it over and, and do this. I have um, Dr. Shapiro, who's the chief medical examiner. He comes in and shows them an autopsy video, which all of the students grossed out but then love. Um, I have a friend toxicologist come in and um, Detective Sergeant Potter comes in and he walks them through a real case. So he talks about you know how this case got started, what it looked like when they first got there, and then how the evidence collection led to more information, how they figured out eventually who did this and how. And so that case study really ties together what I've talked about through the whole semester. And it has some arson investigation, it has some DNA analysis, so it gets to sort of bookend what I've been teaching them. The osteology from last Tuesday, uh, she talked about how bones told a lot about a person. So like, it's interesting how like even after like everything else goes away, like your bones could be like fossilized and that could still like years later tell a lot about like what type of life you lived, um, what your diet was, how your teeth were, um, like your height, did you have any diseases, did you survive any diseases? And that was just really fascinating. I've been a detective for seven years. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for 14 years. I initially detective Sergeant in Mark Hampton. Potter comes to Yonan's class to share techniques and case studies. He says that the fingerprinting methods the students are learning are what he and his colleagues use in the field. The ones that we use on a regular basis are the ones that we used here today. Potter says that while there are some advances in the products they use, the techniques for collecting evidence are tried and true. 
not much has changed in fingerprinting. It's pretty much the same. Uh, there's new applications and things like that that are developed by uh, Searchy and, and things like that. But the practice in taking uh, fingerprints has kind of remained the same, uh, at least in my time. For the students, a key lesson of the semester is that in real life, forensics is a lot different than what it looks like on TV. Forensics in general is something that people assume that they know from watching TV shows because there's so many of them, but a lot of what is seen on TV isn't actually what would happen um, in a forensics case. So it's interesting to learn. It's not TV shows at all. It's like the further I get into the research and like read books about it, it's just not even close. And it, but it's right, ten times more fascinating. Right. It show up. Learning how to read a crime scene and collect the clues yeah. left behind. These UVM students are on the case. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Rebecca. Joining me now are two guests. Amanda Yonan is a lecturer at the UVM Biology Department. She teaches genetics, DNA analysis, and forensic biology. And Detective Sergeant Mark Potter is a veteran of the Vermont State Police and one of the experts that Amanda incorporates in her class, as you just saw. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks. Now, Amanda, how long have you been teaching the forensics biology, forensic biology course, and have things changed over the years? Yep. I've been teaching about 10 years, mm -hmm. and when I first started teaching, I started out mostly lecturing, sort of a standard format. So I would stand in the front of the class, and the students would just write down what I say. And I saw a lot of students leaving class or not attending mm -hmm. unless it was a test or something where they had to be there. And so uh, one of the things that I've done over the years is try to get more active, hands-on learning. And so the students see the benefit in coming to class. They get to do things like the fingerprinting, um, watch lots of videos. And another thing that has changed is how I'm teaching this material. Mm -hmm. um, and so what sort of cases that I use and try to keep it really close to the real world applications. Is some of that um, a little gruesome? Yeah, I don't like some of the pictures and movies that I use. So sometimes I will actually look away. Um, but the students seem to respond. And the more gruesome and bloody the pictures or videos are, the more they like it. So. <laughs> Uh, tell us about some of the sources that you, you use to teach forensic biology. Yeah, so I use some movie clips and TV shows like a CSI. Mm -hmm. I actually use a couple of clips from a Dirty Harry movie that are really <laughs> actually pretty good about ballistic mm -hmm. information. Um, and then the other th major source is these guest speakers that come in. So Mark Potter comes in. I also have uh, the chief medical examiner, a forensic toxicologist who talks about poisons and how to determine what's inside different tissues in the human body. Um, a forensic anthropologist comes in and talks about how to identify sex and age from just bones and teeth. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. So, Mark, how long have you been in law enforcement and crime scene investigating? Uh, I've been in law enforcement for 15 years mm -hmm. uh, in crime scene uh, for about seven and a half. Talk a little bit about your involvement with the forensics class during the semester and some of the things that, that you, knowledge that you impart to the kids. Yeah, so uh, it initially started um, as a, uh, when I worked out of the chief medical examiner's office as a liaison for the state police and the class, uh, the initial lecture was, was just a uh, introduction to um, forensics and how it applies to law enforcement and it's kind of morphed into uh, several other um, classes that I come in and, and guest teach um, and the second one is a fingerprint uh, day where Amanda talks about uh, fingerprint analysis and things like that. And uh, we've put together a practical where the students actually have an opportunity to, um, to identify latent prints uh, and, and um, use different products in, in um, extracting those prints and, and seeing how it's actually done. Uh, and the third uh, lecture that I come in is a uh, case study where it's uh, an opportunity for the students to see uh, what they've learned throughout the semester and uh, see how it's actually put into uh, use practically in an actual homicide investigation. Because obviously homicide <clears throat> investigations take a tremendous amount of time and effort yes, and attention yeah. to detail. Yes. So tell me a little bit about why it's important for the students to get this hands-on, especially with the fingerprinting demonstration. Well, I think it, it, it brings it into perspective of actually how um, meticulous um, lifting the latent prints actually is. You know, when you read about something, oftentimes you have a false sense of, um, 
of uh, how easy things can be and when you're exposed to, to actually doing it practically, doing the uh, lifting the prints and things like that, uh, they can see that it's a lot harder than, uh, than just uh, reading about it. And, Harder, but also too a lot of pressure. I would imagine if you're conducting an investigation, you have to get things right the first right. time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also the details that you have to pay attention to. Yes. Yes. So why did you make this commitment to help teach? You know, I think from a state police perspective, it's a good opportunity for public relations and um, gives us an opportunity to get into the classrooms and and talk to uh, potential applicants with the state police and. Uh, give them an exposure to uh, what we do uh, with crime scene investigation and how it applies to the state police. Um, but also, I, I like to teach and I enjoy uh, speaking to the students. And um, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's enjoy. Uh, it really brings uh, uh, a sense of uh, enjoyment on my part when I have you know students that are intrigued in the subject and um, are asking questions and and um, really have a. An interest in law enforcement and crime scene investigation. Mm -hmm. Do students come into the class knowing what to expect or are they surprised by all the information that they get and what they get to do? Um, they, <clears throat> they now know there's a lot of sort of buzz around campus mm -hmm. about the class so they now know that they'll do things like fingerprinting um, which you know they didn't before maybe um, but one of the things I think they come in with the misconceptions from watching the TV shows right that things are gonna be really easy that we can do DNA in a half hour and then just go get the guy <laughs> and so so those kind of misconceptions definitely come into the class and between my lectures and the guest speakers I think by the end of the semester they sort of realize that science is hard and takes time and it takes experts to do it and then you can get all that information out. Can you give us a sense Mark of the kind of time commitment it takes to put a case together? Um, I mean every case is different. Yeah right? you know every case is different um, but it's it, it's hours upon hours uh, from uh, and it's, uh, it's really collaborative. It's um, crime scene investigation. It's uh, the detectives behind the scenes. It's so important for, um, you know, the, uh, the, the detectives working the, the, um, the case itself to uh, have that dialogue with crime scene investigators because a lot of times things at the scene are pertinent to their investigation. Uh, things of evidence that, uh, uh, that are gleaned through interviews and things like that uh, make it uh, very important for uh, the investigators at the scene processing um, to be able to facilitate a, a, um, a, a conviction at the end of the day. Uh, but there's a lot of moving parts with uh, the investigative aspect, the detectives out doing peripheral interviews, um, tying things together uh, with today's environment of uh, electronics. There's always an electronic component now with uh, right. cell phones and uh, so subpoenas and search warrants with that and, uh, and uh, crime scene investigation is always uh, changing. So. Uh, so there's um, a, a lot of hours they can put into uh, to every case. Amanda, what are some of the challenges to teaching forensic biology? There's a couple. One are the misconceptions that mm -hmm. the students bring in from the popular press. Um, another is that some of it is just really technical. And this is one of those classes where it could be absolutely any major can take this class. Um, and to graduate from UVM, you have to have at least taken one science class. So this provides an opportunity for students to take that science requirement, but in a fun, interesting environment and talking about an interesting topic. But what that means is that the students have a wide background difference when they first come in. So I've got some students who already have a pretty good handle on DNA and how we might genotype it. And then I've got other students who don't really know what DNA is. They've mm -hmm. just heard of it. Um, so it's challenging to figure out what I need to explain to the students and what I can sort of assume that they already know. And so just the technical difficulty of some of the techniques requires them to sort of go back. For example, the DNA genotyping, that mm -hmm. is the hardest every semester. Right. And so what are the opportunities for young people who study forensic science as far as jobs? Jobs. Yeah. There's a ton. Um, so it sort of depends on what the students are interested in. They could go through the police route, you mm -hmm. know, become a detective, and then they would be right there on the crime scene and working with the techs that are running some of these different pieces of evidence. Uh, if they were interested in doing autopsies, they would probably go to medical school and become a pathologist. Uh, if they were interested in chemistry or biology, for example, genotyping the DNA, you would get a graduate degree 
in genetics or chemistry, uh, you know, anthropology, mm -hmm. and then become one of those experts that produces that data that helps the detectives figure out what happened. Well, it sounds like there are a lot of different directions that students can go after learning these things. It's true. There's yeah. a lot of times as well, too, that, um, you know, the students often ask me that, do I, uh, how do I get into yeah. uh, the detectives and things like that? And, you know, for the state police perspective, there's a lot of, um, you, you know, you, you need to be on for a little bit to be able to do that. But mm -hmm. one of the things that I like to stress is that uh, you don't necessarily have to be a detective to be able to apply these techniques. You know, we're in rural Vermont, and mm -hmm. a lot of the, um, you know, the troopers do um, out on the field uh, do investigations that uh, that oftentimes involve these things with burglaries and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have to points stop it here because we're just about out of time, but yeah. <laughs> sounds like a great topic. Yeah. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.